Oh, hey, Elena. How are you today? I'm currently doing well. How are you? I'm great. It's the last Friday of the week. Now, the first question that I ask everybody is, how do you like your coffee in the morning? I like my cappuccino hot and double shot of cappuccino. <laughs> now you're saying cappuccino and double shot. Do you have like a, a do you have an espresso maker? Do you have a machine to do this? Yes, I have a machine. Every time that I'm moving from place to place, for example, when I moved here to Canada, the first thing that I bought was the espresso machine. <laughs> <laughs> so I can start my morning in the right mood, in the right way. <laughs> I think that is the motto for most business owners. <laughs> that is literally <laughs> the best step forward. Uh, cool. So tell me. What is it that you do and why do you do it? Well, I have my own consultancy company where I help tech leaders, specifically from the SaaS industry. I'm helping tech leaders in the C-level or in the level under that, and I'm helping them to drive growth and scale within their companies. I'm doing that by understanding the way that they operate their processes and their product development within the company. And I'm helping them to understand how can they be more market fit, how do they understand their customers in a better way, and how do, do they create products with customer-centric in mind. So I believe that everything is around mindset, and if you have the right mindset in place, you will be able to create good products that resonate with your customers and bring you a lot of revenue to the company. Now let's and, let's dig into that then. Yeah. So if a lot of people have a lot of ideas, an idea is only an idea until you actually start working on it and start building that product out. Now I know you're working with more like established businesses, but say they want to start a new product because one of their employees has a great idea for innovation. What would that journey look like? So first, you have to crisp your idea very clearly to understand what actually are you looking to resolve. Crisping the idea meaning that you can talk with different stakeholders within the company or if you don't have a company, you can talk with different friends that you can explain to them your idea in order to look on the same idea from different corners and to understand how different people resonate with this idea. Once you understand the idea, what value it's going to bring, what pain point it's going to address, I think the next step would be to actually understand whether there is a market for that. So you can explore whether there are customers who would be interested for this idea. You can explore whether there are competition in this market that will resonate with this idea because somebody else already thought about it and maybe you have some extra top feature to provide unique and will help you to differentiate your idea from the market. But you actually need to understand whether this idea will bring something addition to the market or it will be like like most of the features that we are developing, something that is nice to have, but nobody is using. Okay, so you've, obviously you've had an idea about the product um, and let's take it on your first point. You've, you've got uh, stakeholders around you, or you've got, you've got friends around you, just depending on where you're at. Now, depending on different cultures and different, your, your environment, you're going to get very different feedback about your product idea. And then so I would like to dig into if there is some biases within your environment. So let's say I've got an idea, I've done a bit of research, I know this is a good idea, but the people around you are saying this is a terrible idea. How do you validate whether it is it is a good or bad idea? idea to take forward with this product or feature? So good or bad idea, it's not black and white. And if somebody didn't like your idea, it doesn't mean that your idea is not good. It means that you weren't able to explain the value that this idea will bring and show how this will affect that specific person. So every time when you are presenting your idea for somebody, you can present it to your stakeholders just as a brainstorm, but also when you are presenting it, for example, to upper management or for investment opportunity, you have to understand what is going to be the value for them from the idea perspective. You should look at them as if they are your customers, because in this particular case, they are your customers. So either like when the idea is going to be the market, your customers would need to be persuaded that 
this will resolve some kind of a pain point for them. But these days, when you are trying to convince your stakeholders, your management, your investor, that this idea is worth investing in, and it's always worth investing, right? But it's the matter of how would you present that. So you should show them their value. You should show how it will reflect on the current situation, on the current strategy, on how, my, how much money they will be able to get from this idea, how their customers will be able to benefit from this idea. And once you're able to do that, every idea becomes a good idea. Because if I'm thinking about some, something, but you can't see how you make money from it, you wouldn't agree to invest in it. But once you would understand how it relates to your customer, how it improves your business, how it makes money and add revenue, in that case, you will definitely agree and move forward. By the way, it can turn to a bad idea. You can do the testing and understand that the customers don't really need this or they don't like it or probably maybe it's too expensive. But just as an ideation process, try to think from the other side. How can you convince them that it's a good idea? What is the value that you will bring to them? I, I I really like that because that does really work at every level. I also just this just this is really from my experience. You know, you were saying you might get to a point and you actually go, "Well, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea because it isn't just it." Like you said, the the consumers just don't want it for there's like X Y Z reason. But through that process, what I found if you've gone this is my initial idea but then I've gone and double checked it against the problems I'm trying to solve for a very specific audience this is the revenue the economic engine that I could build the channel and distribution for this this specific product and then how can we that how can we then we this make this happen through those three different criterias you might actually go I now have a better idea than my original idea. So even though the first idea becomes technically a a bad idea, it becomes a good idea because it's a new idea (laughs) that is far more suitable through that fact-finding mission. And all of that is really valuable time, you know? And and then, like I said, you might go back out, then you go back out to those same group of friends, re-communicate the value to them and they go, right, now we get it. Now we understand like what is it that you're doing here. There is one journey. good tool that product managers use is try to enter to the shoes of your customer. So when you're communicating your idea, try to enter to the shoes of the person who is listening to this idea. Or when you are uh, pitching this idea to investor, try to enter to the investor shoes or the, to the manager shoes or to the stakeholder shoes and look at the same idea from their perspective and ask yourself what questions would they ask you and what answers would they like to get to be convinced that your idea is something that worth checking, something that worth proceeding with. Now, if we've got a, an ex- cause that's like, if it's, let's say, that's the scenario, of this is a new product. Let's say you have a, an existing business, you have an existing product. Um, we know because we have external external factors to the business that always changes consumer behavior to consumer attitudes uh technology how people be able to engage with that product so now we're talking about like innovation is there how different is the process to innovate a product than it is from developing a product i think that it's a bit easier when you have a product in the market and you're Based on this product, you actually can understand the behavior of the customer and you can talk with your customer based on this product. So this is your customer, like you already have those customers to try to talk with and understand what are they currently facing, what is their current journey, how do they current, what is the current experience for them with the product Mm -hmm. and try to understand in between the lines what's missing for them. Usually customers don't really know what they are missing, what they would need. But if you talk to their pain points, if you talk to their process, if you really understand why they're doing that and not that, you would understand what's currently missing. And talking with one or two customers is pointless. You have to talk with a bunch of them to actually understand what are the big items that you need to invest in. Because you can't really develop a scalable solution if you are listening only to one or two customers. You always need to think about the scale. You always need to think about 
how many people can get value from this idea that I'm currently looking to develop. And once you're having a new idea that nobody ever tried before or nothing that you, somebody can relate to, it's very hard to do the testing because you have to do the development from scratch. But once you already have something, so talking to your customers based on this something make it much easier to understand where are the missing points and what are the innovations that are required in order to perfect this idea or not only perfect it, but make it like in a higher level for your customers so they feel appreciated, so they feel like somebody is listening to them, so they feel that your product resonates with their needs and your product evolves with their needs because the market evolves every day. Customers keep looking for more, competition is getting harder right? Like today's innovation is tomorrow old news. So you always need to be with the trend. You always need to understand the market. You always need to listen to your customers to predict what's going to be the next development and what next idea can actually bring them the extra value that they're looking for. I, I love that. But, uh, then you're yeah, really digging into the details. What would be your top three tips on how a business owner or a C-suite team create a customer feedback loop so that they always get they always get the, that information and knowledge from the customer. Now, if I kind of paint a bit of a picture, um, you know, customers, if without being prompted, the only time they'll ever kind of really contact a company is to is to basically say, hey, this is not working or hey, I need uh, either to stop my trial or I need to get a return on, you know, that's always going to be the majority of the correspondence to get anything good like testimonials or just even uh, a fact finding like experience from the customer, the good and the bad and, the, and kind of um, what extra things they want from the product. That's always going to be a bit of a challenge. So. I go say we say the question: How does a C-suite level go about creating a robust customer feedback? So I think that the easiest way is to actually create metrics that measure the customer engagement with your product. And there are a lot of companies that do not measure behavior, do not measure the journey, do not really understand what is the funnel of the customer within your product and what's interrupting the customer in the way they are using the product itself. So I would say that measure, setting measurements, the, the right measurements within your website or within your app or within every type of product that you're providing would be the first step to start with, to actually gather data about your customers from the way that they are using the product. The second thing is to provide the customer an easy way to interact with you while they are using the product. Something is not working, connect us. You need some additional help, connect us. I've been uh, using the CRM. I won't mention the name of the CRM, but when I uh, engage with the CRM, I engage with it because I thought it's very easy to use because like the first impression that I've got from it, that it was easy to onboard and it was actually providing me with the benefits that I was looking for. But after using it for months, I found out issues that I don't like, that I would like to contact support team to somehow get their explanation or guidance or, mm -hmm. or even telling me that this do not exist today and that's, that's the reason why. And I'm finding it very hard to even find the button of connect us and write us this complaint or write us this information that can engage with us or tell us you, about your experience. So even making that easier and better and more approachable for the customer will provide the customer the option to tell you what's wrong or what they would like to have. And third thing is to actually approach to your customers, talk with them and understand what's happening, how are they enjoying their product, what would they like to have as additional uh, functionalities within the product. You can maybe set virtual tables, that way those customers are sitting around one table and you don't need to invest one-on-one -on -one time with your customers. Or you can do some kind of an education about your platform and at the same time give a lot of time to your customers to actually provide feedback on what they are using, on what they would like to have. So those three ways are good ways to communicate with your customers, to get data, to be more approachable 
and to actually listen to them and read between the lines of what they are saying. And that has been, if we really look over the like the history of business, that has been the revolution, let's call it, of the last 20, 40 years now, where you know, making businesses and making products so human, I'm going to say human focused, people focused, where if you allow your customers to be a part of the product development journey, they're going to be far more invested in your your brand because they feel like they've had some part or some ownership, in, you know, in the journey. I'll give you I'll give you a few case studies, you know, on the the real effects of this. So, in the UK and actually the global now uh, is Brewdog. Uh, they've been the big mate, a really big driver of this kind of initiatives. So they started off with the one or two beer brands, but they regularly now as a campaign every year or two, is they go and ask their audience, hey guys, we want you to name the product. We want you to kind of create what style of product is. We want to say how you want to brand this product. They just basically delegated (laughs) several departments worth of work to their customers and it was like, hey guys, some of you, quite a lot of your customers, you guys are all shareholders in BrewDog. You also get a say in in these products and developments. And it's not surprising that it's a success for them every year. And that 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 beer, that one like limited line of beer that they bring out, sells sells out every year because their customers well. made it, created it, and then they just bought it themselves. And it saves BrewDog a whole ton of marketing budget. It saves them a whole ton, ton of product development and innovation budget. You know, it, it makes them fun. It makes them creative. It just ticks a whole bunch of boxes. So that's a real life recent kind of case study. Um, but dare I say that the real OG case study that I always bat around for this kind of stuff is always Apple. You know, the Apple as the, the, the brand and the technology, they are by far not the best in the market. You know, if you want the best in the market, you, you're kind of looking at IBM and you're looking at Dell and you're looking at Microsoft. Techni- technically, their stuff is better. But product-wise, from a user experience, that's not their main focus or main driver as a, as a business. And it switches off a mass market who are not, a big mass market who are not just that technically minded to, to want to have the best product. Uh, to give you an example, I have an Apple phone, I have Apple AirPods, I have an Apple Watch. This is an Apple Mac, <laughs> um, and the reason and the reason for it is, is I know it's not the best product out there, but all of my products talk to each other. They all they all integrate with each other. If I get a message on my phone, I'll get a message on my Apple Watch. My Apple Watch links in with my phone, which links in with my laptop, which links into my headphones. And I didn't have to do any of that. It just did it all for me. And that was the incredible user experience that you that I get from, from it. And it does, and at the end of the day, we're sat here, we're, we're talking on a podcast. This is a heavy software that we use to record the podcast and my computer is absolutely fine. It's a nice lightweight computer that is doing everything. So technically as a user, we've ticked all the boxes here and I don't need the best product on the market. I just need something that's the easiest right. on the market. The technology that making your life easier is the technology that you will purchase. And as leaders within the ecosystem, as leaders who are creating this type of technology, we need to understand that that as the same way that we have this first impression about people, the same way we have a first impression about the products that we are looking to use. And I understand that sometimes you are staying with the same product because you're already invested in it. But this is not the good reason why you want to, why why you want your customer to stuck with your product. You want your customers to be there, not because they love, hate it, but because they actually love it, because they're invested in it but they would want to stay invested in it because it actually provides them value. It's simple to use. It's easy to engage, giving them what they are looking to have. It's solving their pain points. And there are a lot of pain points to solve, right? You just need the right approach to solve these pain points and the customers are yours. Exactly. Now, you mentioned first impressions there. Uh, You're absolutely right. If you want to know the stats, when you meet a person for the very first time, a person will 
literally getting like get an impression of you in the first three to five seconds and then to change that initial impression of you from that first three to five seconds it takes up to two and a half minutes three minutes of conversation for that to for that to alter now that's just an interaction between two people you know what we're saying here is an, a person and a product interaction what are some of the things within that journey that creates a good impression well the onboarding process <laughs> that would be probably it because when you're looking on your product you would like to have an easy onboarding and i feel like a lot of companies are failing with that because the processes that we're looking to provide to our customers are so heavy that sometimes we're not thinking that the customer shouldn't face this heaviness in front of him. So when you are creating a customer-centric product, you are creating a product that would be very easy to approach and very easy to start using. And the investment in order to start using it shouldn't be as heavy as it currently is. And no matter what product you are having or what heavy processes you are having, it shouldn't be as heavy as it is. And there, every time there is a way to make it lighter, no matter how much information, for example, um, like Google and uh, all those, all those companies are providing you like the seamless um, one sign option that you can now sign to any kind of app through using the Gmail, right? This was just incredible idea because it makes your life easier. You're just clicking on one button and you are set within any type of app that doing the single sign on functionality within their app. So before that, you probably would need to provide your details and your password and save the password somewhere and maybe some more information that the company is looking to get about you. But today, through this single sign on, you're having this capability with one click. So I understand that maybe this is a more um, B2C approach, but for B2B, it's actually valid as well. It shouldn't be as heavy as it is. And if you're developing a product that is customer-centric, meaning that your onboarding process is lighter, meaning that you are collecting the information in a way that is lighter for your customer, your sales process become much easier and less time consuming. Your marketing becomes easier and less budget consuming and people are actually coming to your product in a less period of time and enjoying the product for a larger period of time, meaning that your revenue is growing and you're getting customers that are more satisfied with your product than it was before. Now, I like that you brought out that B2C and B2B, it, 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 isn't, I don't, it isn't different. You, It's so easy to say, oh, well, I'm B2B, it's much harder. No, at the end of the day, B2B is still people. It might, be, it might be a term of business to business, but business is really driven by people and it's still business to, it's still people to people. Um, and there is enough tools out there. Uh, for instance, Calendly is, I think, my ultimate B2, B2B tool because I just send a link to, to people and it, it gives them an a automated onboarding with a nice message, gives them a reminder, it uh, gives them the correct link. You know, it's all of these little details that just help a person out. And at the end, end of the day, I only have to set it up once and send it out to them. And the tools now do all the heavy lifting. I like that you said there's a um, people, there's um, fails that business owners are, um, you know, they're doing. What are some of those fails that are have been detrimental to them? Well, I think that when you are building a very heavy B2B system, you actually collect a lot of data about your customers, about their customers. And usually those these heavy data, you assume that it should have heavy lifting as well. And when you are creating those systems with heavy data, it doesn't mean that it should take a lot of time to gather this data, to analyze this data, because the systems that we are using are so technical and are so, uh, they are complex, but at the same time, the calculation abilities are much quicker than they were before, meaning that you can use those systems outside of 
what you have developed in order to help you create a better experience for your customers. I was working in my corporate life in Amazon and Intel, Microsoft, and usually those companies are developing something inside. Usually they're not taking products from outside in order to make the life of people who are working within the companies and the people who are using those services, they're not using those extra products. And maybe it's the right way for those companies because they don't want to share their data or they thinking about violation of any kind. But actually, if we are going to partner with more companies and we're going to create solutions that are actually beneficial for all the sites, I think we will be living in a better world that is easier for us, easier for our customers and allows us to create better, easier technology, faster and creating like solution that is shareable between all the companies and not only something that we holding up tight and uh, looking of how I'm not going to share this information because somebody's going to use it for their benefits and, I, and, I, and I'm not going to benefit from that. So think about what products do exist in the market today and or maybe if you don't want to use a product, think what would you do within your company to improve what you're already having in order to shorten the time of the onboarding, in order to create those processes easier, in order to upload the data in a different way than the one to require from the consumer, all this intervention within the product. So things are supposed to be simple. And I think that we, when we are taught in school, we are taught that if you're thinking about a very simple solution it's probably not the right solution you should think about something that is more complicated and i think that we're taking it to our life as engineers as leaders later on yeah. <laughs> it's not true. sometimes the simplest solution is the best one so look for the simplest solution and if the simple one is not working then you can make it harder but start with the simple one i like that i really like that you brought that up it's uh Oh, okay. I see these, I do see these things online sometimes where something has been so en- over engineered because they, they, they've they looked for them. They've just been, they, they can't believe that the simple solution is the best solution. And so then they come up with this really complicated, really elaborate like approach. And you're right. We, I think we, because we're taught it at school, we just kind of, we still fall into that pattern I mean, actually sometimes simple is best. Now, I want to kind of, uh, you know, redirect to to you. How did, what has your journey been like to get to um, helping C-suite owners and businesses to, to grow and scale through products? I started my journey as a software engineer. I've been working as a software engineer to understand better the technical material, to understand better in depth. And because I'm a, I'm a, I am an analytical person, that is looking to solve the problems from from the analytical perspective. But very fast, fast, I understood that being a software engineer is not my type of thing. And I was working in a small company where we had a product manager who was involved in everything, who could see the bigger picture, but actually dive deeper, who can take the puzzle pieces and create one singular picture that works for everybody, who was talking with the customers, but at the same time understood the developers and the enablers and the hardware team and was able to convey the message to the management and to uh, explain why should they invest the budget into those products. And for me, it was like the dream job. So I converted my software engineering degree to an MBA with an entrepreneurial direction. And I moved working with Intel as a business analyst slash project manager slash product manager, because in different companies, you're calling it in a different way. So it was somewhere there to understand better the data, understand how you can uh, create faster the decisions, how you can manage your products, project in a better way. And from there, it like it was an exponential move, movement toward this product and strategy. So whenever I went to the different departments within Intel and later on in Amazon, I was able to take something from zero, from an idea create the ideation around that and take it to the next step as the product, meaning talking with the stakeholders, understanding the whys, the whats, the when, understanding the all the ideas, like how this idea resonates with everybody, 
building a framework around this solution and after that taking it to market but to do that it's also was very important to understand what's already working what's not working what needs some improvement and how do we do this improvement in order to create the customer life this year and uh the pr release the press release document that we were working in amazon i know that a lot of companies are a lot of people are talking about the processes within amazon because they do have very extensive and good processes that i think that a lot of companies should adopt maybe not in that extent as amazon is doing because i was feeling that i'm doing 70% of writing during my product work there but at the same time those processes were very essential to each product because you had this idea you were doing an ideation with yourself later on with your stakeholders and then you were writing it on paper in order to make sure that you have covered all the corner cases to make sure that you have addressed all the possible questions that can be raised from different directions mm-hmm. make sure that you understand the value proposition that you are bringing to the market to the company to your stakeholders from money wise from business perspective from customer pain point to make sure that the market actually needs this and all of this was covered in one document when you had one pager the press release maybe two pages not more than that but also you could have like six pages of questions and answers in order to clarify about the process so the process itself was good and i enjoyed very much the part of the strategy the part of talking with stakeholders the part of understanding what existing and what should be fixed and how do you fix it within those type of strategies within the customer centricity and that's why i decided to go on my own because i have the knowledge of all the processes i understand customers and i would like to help companies technological companies to bring this understanding to bring this mindset to their company of how do you turn customer centric idea into something that revolutionizes the market in a year from now or something that actually makes our life easier so that's that that uh, was well, is it is an incredible journey and what is what's really striking out to me is um your you starting out your career as a software developer how does that help and change your perspective when implementing your your business and your role now well i think that um when you are thinking as an engineer you have very strong analytical thinking so you are capable of diving deep into a situation and understanding it from data perspective and it's very important to use data when you are doing your decision when you are mm-hmm. making those movements because everything is based on data and if you're doing assumptions just because the wind blew in specific direction this is not a way that will bring you forward so the analytical um abilities that i've gathered as an engineer looking at things from different perspective understand the possible corner cases understand whether it's feasible or not feasible and what capabilities would it require in order to develop that and so, sometimes i'm not capable to say what capabilities because i'm not at as in depth as required but when i'm speaking with a person i can explain him what's needed and how does it look and what would the customer benefit and this discussion can come from different direction it can come from the technical direction from the business direction from the strategy direction like we can build a comprehensive picture out of that so should be technical or not and i do understand that product managers and say the say they what and not the how but if the product manager can understand the how as well the what can be built in a better way than if the product manager do not understand so you can communicate between the customer and the engineers in a better way and talk in both of the languages that are right. I mean as well I think that's a really interesting question to whether a product manager needs to be technical or not and in how i you just my experience and how i always visualize it is is far more looking at the the team itself um and so for instance you, i think i think you can have both and it just depends on the team that they with there with they in because as you said if you've got the developer who are very very on the tech and got the product manager who's kind of in the middle and then usually 
uh, you've got somebody like me, the, the marketeer, <laughs> who just wants to take all of this vast amount of information and, you know, and turn it into materials. But the, from my job, my role, if the foundation, the foundational work, the fact finding work isn't as in depth as it could be, like you're saying, if I'm really doing the what and the how, um, then my output's not going to be as great, you know, but if I've got really good information, it's really covered all the different areas, then then how I will take all of that information to then to do the distribution channels. You, at the end of the day, the, you're going to get so much more from a team. You're going to get so much more product develop. You're going to have a better product development and innovation and better results at the end of the day. So that's, yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. So final final question kind of, of of today is what does what does success look like to you success in product implementation yeah this could be for yourself as for your business or to your clients and your customers well for me a success for my business would be if i can bring this customer centricity to more and more companies in the world to explain them that while we are looking to get a great revenue and to scale and to grow, we are actually looking to resonate with our customers and to make sure that we are actually creating technology that is easier to use, that is more affordable, that is more, uh, that that's actually resonate with our customers. And this is the mindset that I'm coming with to my customers and the mindset shift that I'm trying to do with my customers. And by the way, a lot of customers do think that they have customer centricity mindset within their company. Usually, not usually, but in most of the cases, it's not that. So they do try to understand their customers, but they are very much motivated from sales or from project or from marketing. And while all of them work together, we should understand who is paying us at the end and who is paying us is the customer. And if we want the customer to keep paying us, we need to make sure that we are addressing all their needs and that we are providing actually a solution that can become viral, that can be a trend and that can attract our customers in and keep them in for as long as we are do provide a value. <laughs> so that would be a success for me. I love it. I think that is a really great, nice place to end. Um, now, if somebody wants to, to get in contact with you today, how can somebody reach you? So I have a website uh, that is called emperorconsulting.ca. I will share with you the link later on and LinkedIn. I'm very available and approachable there as well. So happy to connect. And, and yeah, how can they find you on LinkedIn? What's your full name? LinkedIn is Yelena Lehman. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I think this has been really, really valuable and, and really, really enjoyable. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Charlie.